which is that uh, there are certain uh, certain types of concepts, uh, you know, and, and uh, ideas that you have to be familiar with as a bis as an MBA student. And so, what what we'll be doing in le legal aspects of business is I, I have selected those ideas and those principles, and we will go through them. And so, your job is really to uh, ensure that I mean, this is basically what you need to know. These are the things the stuff the stuff we will be studying are the things that we need to know as a uh, business student uh, the uh, aspects of the law that you need to be aware of and we will teach it in a very uh, in a very intensive manner more intensive than what is done in an LB program but it will be beneficial for you because if you're doing it properly you will get a very good insight into how judges ultimately decide cases and that will give you insight even even when you later on if you are doing something like contract drafting some of you might go into HR in HR you do a lot of employment contract drafting right and uh, other kinds of contracts in a commercial sense it will give you a lot of insight because even contract drafting and agreement drafting if you do loan agreements and things like that or tenancy agreements everything has to be done eventually with an eye on how a judge is going to decide that case because when you draft an agreement you have to assume that everything that could possibly go wrong will go wrong <laughs> and then eventually it goes to litigation and so how will the judge decide the case so when you're drafting a contract or any other kind of legal document what is going through your head is how a judge would decide this case if it ever came to litigation all right so therefore or arbitration which is another form of uh, so resolving the dispute so uh, therefore it's very important so that's why the focus of this course is to give you a very intensive grilling and give you some comfort level with uh, understanding the principles based on which judges would decide certain cases um, and so that's what we're going through. So this is a slightly unusual top uh, module that you find uh, in most business schools in legal aspects of business. There is uh, this kind of module does not exist, jurisprudence and legal theory. But I think it's important because it gives you the theoretical frameworks to understand how decisions are being taken by judges. So it's a little, it's understand, it's important to understand some of these ideas. Okay. So we first start. So what we'll have, what we'll be doing essentially is there'll be a bunch of concepts that I'll be throwing at you, and this is all written down in notes, and this note is already in your folder okay if you see in your unit notes folder this is already your student folder all the stuff which we have discussed is already here and um, the unit zero labs I'll, I'll move the unit zero notes also into this okay which we can do um, so unit one which I'm now teaching is already here there will also be a spreadsheet which I will put into your uh, notes I'm gonna move this into unit notes all right, so your unit zero is also here all right okay so what we are going to do uh, we are going to just go through a bunch of concepts initially before we get into the cases the actual judgments that we are going to study once we get into the uh, particular modules like contract law company law etc and uh, the and your job is to essentially understand these concepts so my role really as a teacher is not so much to make it interesting to you because you need to be interested in this stuff but really to explain the concept to you so if you don't understand a concept I'm happy to explain it 14 times and your role is to basically pay attention in the class and so that you understand what is being said and then if you don't understand you have to ask a question even if you don't understand a, li a little bit you should ask a that's your only duty to pay attention and to ask questions <coughs> and if, uh, if you don't understand I'll explain it as many times as required so that is my role is this clear okay so please uh, move let's move accordingly so the first idea that we are going to discuss is the first unit is called jurisprudence and legal theory now what is jurisprudence it's a big word so let's um, uh, understand this point okay what does mean what does it mean so we use the word jurisprudence in two ways uh, that is uh, there's a little bit of font types are mixed up as you can see here this font is Arial, this font is Meriwether but this kind of stuff is because I you know I'm not these are we're not really focused on niceties like this but later on when you do marketing and stuff please be careful you'll notice something you can do this experiment for yourself if you're designing a poster one of the cardinal rules is you should not mix font type when you because visually it will create dissonance for somebody who is if you're designing a marketing poster you can experiment with this don't mix you understand what I mean by font types yes, this is this is aerial okay this is a different font Meriwether if you mix up font types in a body of text when somebody's reading it 
it creates visual dissonance dissonance you understand it's like lack of harmony a little bit of disturbance so these are all finer points you have to think about when you're designing when you're looking at marketing aspects designing posters this that billboard design everything that is visual if you design uh, be aware of this but in this class we are not going to bother because this is just meant for our mutual convenience okay uh, all right okay first point jurisprudence uh, what does it mean uh, it's generally used in two senses either we use it to refer to the entire body of laws and the body of laws um, this means uh, acts uh, and judgments text somebody may write a big textbook on contract law all that forms part of our jurisprudence so we would use this up we would say something like uh, the Indian jurisprudence on contract law so that includes like Mullah on the law of contract that includes the contract act that includes all the judicial decisions that have been handed down on the contract law uh, act so we refer to this entire body of laws and we would say the Indian jurisprudence on the contract act okay or on the law of contract okay we can say the same thing about Indian jurisprudence on income tax etc etc is this clear the first way you use the word right we also got to because you also remember that your your MBA students you're not going into the world marketing yourself as a hardcore programmer or a hardcore mechanical engineer technical specialist so you have to have certain other types of skills so one of those skills is that you should be very good in the use of the language your communication school skills should be superb and you should have the ability to integrate all the different areas and law is one of the areas that you will have to integrate into everything operations into marketing into um, because marketing you have cons concerns like false advertising the consumer protection act covers all those kinds of things so you have to have that lawyers hat on all the time even if you're a marketing guy or operations guy or a finance guy so this is one of the things that you bring in and the use of the language so how to use the words jurisprudence can be used either to refer to the entire body of laws or also to the study of this body of laws okay so when you have the science or the study of your uh, when you talk about jurisprudence it's about the study of you know how these laws should be developed and all these aspects so it's used in two senses so it is the study of the above or the science of the above so we can say study or science okay, science is used in a loose sense not in the sense of physics and chemistry because law is not really a science in that sense right uh, but study or science or the philosophy of how these the body of laws should develop so it's used in two the same word is used in two senses so you have to understand what sense it's being used in all right is this clear so now similar to jurisprudence there's another word which is also used which is one word uh, also used in uh, in a similar way in two senses this word have you guys seen this word before taxonomy so you need to learn some uh, Walia has seen it you're familiar Yes. Okay, what does taxonomy mean? Taxonomy on the economy. Taxonomy on the economy. Uh, tax on the economy. No effects of tax on the economy. No, no, no. <laughs> That's not what it means. <laughs> no so taxonomy is as it, I've already written here in the in the in your notes okay so taxonomy is a word that is used in two senses okay just like in jurisprudence we had put study of the above okay study of the entire or the science of the entire how these body of laws is developed analyzing this body of laws etc and uh, so in that sense in this second sense here which is we have put it first here that taxonomy is essentially the start the science of classification if you remember Everyone remembers your biology class you have all these genus species yes, sir. mammals like human beings are mammals but then all mammals are not humans right so we are called homo sapiens in that classification now dogs are also mammals but dogs you would not call homo sapiens because they are not in that category right so this entire business of this science of classifying uh, a set of objects into certain reasonable cat uh, categories this is what is called taxonomy which is the science of classification of broadly similar in the sense like dogs and humans and dolphins are similar because we are all living beings and then we are also mammals but then we have some further under mammals there are further classifications because we are not exactly like ma dolphins right so therefore there are certain further categories made for human beings all right so uh, therefore uh, what is missing taxonomy based on a law 
rules and regulations. Yeah, so taxonomy is another word which is important for you guys to be aware of because it is important for you as an MBA student to develop the skill of taxonomy. But the point is the reason I thought of this word is because it's very similar to jurisprudence in the sense that jurisprudence is also one word which is used in two different ways, slightly different contexts. And taxonomy is also used in two exactly similar contexts. So taxonomy first is the study of the science of class study of the science of classification. Um, uh, it's actually not. Uh, there should be a bracket here. Study of classification or uh, science of classification. We need to have study of science of. Okay. So either you study what are the principles. That is, in this case, in the first sense of taxonomy, you study. You ask yourself, okay, what are the principles according to which we should classify these uh, entities or these objects, right? What are the principles? What are the laws? We'll discuss some principles below, right? So this is a taxonomy. Then what, what basis should we classify these and how should we classify these? If you're asking questions like that, you're talking about taxonomy as a science of classification. All right. And um, this is one which is science of the above. And then this is the entire body of law. So I'm going to highlight all this. It will also make it easier for you to study. So you know these are the key words, right? But don't memorize, guys, please. Okay. Whenever, remember I told you in the first session, that now you are in a different paradigm that business of mugging up stuff in your undergrad is over now you're studying for a professional degree companies are interested in people who can do things for them for that you need to have conceptual clarity so this business of mugging up stuff is not going to help you in the corporate world in the corporate world people expect uh, you to have very good communication skills good conceptual skills good knowledge of the domain which means everything that's going on in your domain uh, you should be aware of if you're a marketing guy you should know everything that that's going on not just in India in the US if some new Disney Channel has come up you should be aware of it and so for full domain knowledge conceptual news everything and also uh, what was it what was I saying why did I uh, yeah so conceptual clarity is what matters and if you try to mug up things you will not have conceptual clarity is this clear are you getting the message you need to be talking to yourself every day because you're conditioned from your early days to mug up stuff our education system is like that your condition so you need to get out get out of that mode now it's in a different mode you need to be focused on understanding concepts so i'm making it very easy for you i'm giving you all the notes and everything i'm highlighting the keywords but i don't want people sitting on the stairs in the last day before the exam so it's a classification size of classification going like this okay that that is not going to help you in the corporate world okay this is a different ball game now you need to focus on understanding concepts all right you understand it in your own way think about it the way you do it is basically you pay attention in the class and then when you go back maybe once in a week you revise what's been taught and then you try to understand it in your own way all right so first is taxonomy the science of classification how should we classify what kind of categories second is a particular classification is also referred to as taxonomy okay so in the sense and the first sense of jurisprudence where you're referring to the existing body of laws in on the law of contracts in india okay that is you say the indian uh, the current indian jurisprudence on contract law okay that is you're referring to the current set of laws so similarly you can use the word taxonomy also to refer to a particular classification that means for instance if i take all the students on this campus and let's assume there are only four courses llb llm mca and bca so then i take all the students and i put them into each of these uh, boxes so this guy is an mca so obviously if you're an mca student you're not an llb student right so i take all the students and i classify them into llm students llb students mca and bca students four categories and this i would call a taxonomy of whip students are you following there's another way you use the word taxonomy now i'm not using it in the sense of science of classification i'm now referring to a particular classification is this clear you can also have another taxonomy of whip students saying male and female okay wearing glasses or not wearing glasses that's also another taxonomy right so the way you do the taxonomy depends partly on what your objective is is this clear are you following you're getting the use of the word taxonomy all these things are being taught to you because taxonomy is very important and also that you need to be fairly sophisticated in the use of the language the way you use the english language you need to be pretty good at that those of you who are weak in english you need to work on it you need tips i can give you more tips on how to do it because that is one of the things that people will expect of mbas all right okay is this clear now so two new words you've learned jurisprudence and taxonomy both of them are used in two different senses and those two different senses are very are quite similar 
okay now certain important principles of taxonomy which you should follow okay so let's take an example if I have a taxonomy of VIP students saying let's say LLB let's say now there are only two uh, courses I say LLB LLM and females LLB students MLM students and females what is the problem with this taxonomy good so yeah males are excluded that's one problem and somebody used the word mutually exclusive this is the problem because some of the females will be llb students some of the females will be llm students so where do you put them right so you can't have that so that's why the first principle of taxonomy is these principles are important you'll i'll explain briefly why later on but the first principle of good taxonomy is that these are taxa the taxa are the categories okay so when i create uh, a taxonomy of web students saying LLB, LLM, BCA, MCA. Now here that there are four taxa. In this classification, there are four taxa. Okay, LLB, LLM, BCA, MCA. Okay, what happened, Priya? Sir, there is some very bad smell. I can't. Okay, there's some bad smell there. Okay, okay, no problem. Okay, fine. <laughs> All right. Okay, just uh, okay. So is this clear? The use of the word taxa also. That's another new word for many of you probably. So the taxa must be mutually exclusive you can't have a taxonomy saying llb llm females yeah the taxa is just categories so in any taxonomy you will have uh, taxa is basically here see uh, slash categories so in this example let's take this example so if i've designed if i have classified web students into llb llm mca bca in this case i have four taxa if i classify them into male and female i have only two taxa clear all right wearing glasses not wearing glasses again two taxa okay so whatever taxa i have the category should be mutually exclusive that is the first principle all right for it to be meaningful second is that you should minimize the level of high level taxa okay which is the not minimize the level the minimize the number okay what do we mean by that now let's understand this you can look at my own taxonomy a little bit so these are all i do everything in google drive i don't even have anything offline unless i have to so now one of the categories is dsb vips okay so there is everything related to d and then later on there are some other categories which you can see is very low down i mean all dsb admin <coughs> After that, maybe ebooks by subject is another category. So, DSP VIPs and ebooks by subject is on the same level. Are you following what I'm saying? Are you guys following? Like male and female high level. Then I further divide the females and the males into wearing glasses, not wearing glasses. Okay. Then further, I can divide those who are wearing glasses, say, living in North Delhi, not living in North Delhi. I can keep on doing classifications like this so DSB VIPs is one high level category you can see another high level category DSB deletion folder okay that's one so under DS now we are going into one of the high level categories okay now you can see under DSB VIPs I have academics as one category now you can see under DSB VIPs what are the other high level categories under what is academics then there is admin there's comms consulting finance lab marketing mixed etc these are all different high level categories at this level okay within this so what we are saying is and, and now you can see the sub branches under academics I've got academics for each semester sometimes two courses are taught in one semester under academics you can see uh, then here under academics you can see uh, this academics for each semester then this particular semester you can see there are code there's a course then you can see under that there's a subtopic okay then you can see up uh, student folder I think you get the idea by now right are you following what what is being shown here yes. you can see this how you organize information okay it's very important to have a good system of organizing information because otherwise there's too much information in the world so you may suffer information overload and it is important for you to actually uh, scan all the information at the same time you should not be working with incomplete information you have to scan all the information and there's a lot of information so you need to have a system of organizing information properly this is where principles of taxonomy become very important not just for information sometimes you're in a very unstructured situation but now I think you understand what is meant by high level okay so here these these are high level categories and these are low level categories now if you go down to uh, say here 
then this is a like a low level if you're going down to derivatives at this level it is much lower level than this this is clear what i mean by high level low level categories okay so how can we see this uh, as a legal aspect like i'm coming to that i'm coming to it's not so much a legal aspect but some of this uh, discussion is also for general skills that you need to have as an mba student and i'm coming to that okay so we are just talking about uh, the uh, principles of good taxonomy first is mutually exclusive categories second is minimize the number of high level taxa and to help you with that which is don't have too many high level taxa at, at, the, at the top level have few and then there we are and and to allow you to do principle 2 we are giving you some freedom in principle 3 you can freely add levels in the taxonomy what is a level level is like this here you can see this is first level you can say zero level first level second level is also second level third level fourth level here this is fifth level are you following so be free to add levels in the taxonomy but high level tax taxa should be minimized as far as possible if you can bring something into a group you bring it into a group are you clear okay so this is the these are some basic principles. now we'll see now why is this important why are we even having this discussion in most business schools you'll not have this discussion why do we do this because and one of the things that you are expected to have as an mba student is the skill of being able to remember the strategic thinking part of the strategic thinking skill set is being able to bring structure to an unstructured situation okay to trying to bring structure to, because most of the time when you look at problems in the business world they are very unstructured you go into a situation where there's a lot of complexity there's a lot of information uh, and a lot of entities a lot of actors and it looks very unstructured and you have to bring structure to that situation because without structure human beings can't operate we need some kind of structure to get an idea of what exactly are we trying to do here okay so now the skill of taxonomy is very useful because essentially most of the unstructured stuff comes in the form of information so if you have this practice of uh, doing good taxonomy you'll be able to organize information into meaningful and remember once again the kind of taxonomy is that you do is also driven by what is your objective like whip students i can classify into male and female wearing glasses not wearing glasses taller than six feet less than six feet all kinds of classifications are possible so what kind of classification you choose depends on what is your objective what are you trying to do what is the objective of the taxonomy okay but the point is to understand these basic principles of good taxonomy and develop a skill whenever you go around in your life you see situations and try to see if here's a situation which is kind of unstructured how do i organize the information are you following what i'm saying this is something you need to do well because it will be very useful to you in a this is one of the things that people will expect with uh, from mba students the ability to put structure onto an unstructured environment this is clear okay it's a little bit abstract but just think about it okay so like government has uh, earlier there is a different tax structure there are so many acts uh, yeah so many so the uh, government has demolished uh, many of the act and restructured all of them uh, yeah repealed the word that we would use what government is saying government has demolished many of the previous acts repealed. what we would say in a legal con using legal ling lingo we would say the government has repealed but that was one of the agenda items of this modi government that they are going to repeal a lot of the old laws because in india we have many many laws which are on the books which are not being really enforced okay maybe they have lost their relevance but they were on the books so they wanted to repeal some of these laws so the exp expression we I use is they have like repealed the government has add, add uh, some of the acts in a particular one act like there's a 10 act and government has demolished 5 to 10 and don't say demolish keep now you say uh, uh, repeal repeal okay and add them to the uh, in the 1 to 5 yeah okay so for instance like taxonomy uh, yeah so so that is what 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 you were saying is they have done that in a such a way you yeah, know in a systematic way so one of the ways like if you take off from gagan's earlier question what happened here to this aman lokesh lokesh okay so that one can find the information on a particular like yeah so 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 one of the things you can do so but if you go back to gagan's earlier question which is important that what is the value of taxonomy for a legal perspective its taxonomy is valuable in many many situations but in a legal pers uh, from a legal perspective you are trying to study the body of laws in a country you can organize them further into let's say uh, commercial laws criminal laws okay 
all kinds of laws on technology which is also part of the sub part of the commercial laws so you can see here we have all these different acts this is the income tax website they have a lot of these acts you can see all kinds of acts then you can say within finance within commercial laws you can have banking related laws so you can do all kinds of there are many situations where taxonomy will be very useful in organizing information okay I'm sure you're used to it already but I, we are just giving you a certain kind of structure and certain principles to uh, play with okay okay does that uh, clarify your question okay all right okay guys so so these are some new things that you've learned okay now let's go on to our next topic which is so remember this is going to be lecture tutorial style mostly but uh, make sure that you understand these are things you need to learn okay are you guys familiar with these ideas the three organs of the state yes sir. and you are familiar okay the separation of powers okay good so so this is actually a theory that comes from uh, this French writer called Baron Montesquieu separation of powers so how do we separate the powers we create three branches of government okay so we have the three organs of the state we say the legislature so we want to be very careful about how we use words once again remember how to use words okay so the legislature we either say the legislature the executive the judiciary okay either we say this or we say that branches of government three branches of government we say legislative branch executive branch and we don't say judiciary branch we say judicial branch okay is this clear very particular about the use of words yeah it's the same but the categories are the same but the language is slightly different so we are saying when we use the word branch then we say we don't the, the point of this is to make sure that nobody says judiciary branch no no it's not different it's what i'm saying is no no in the sense we are saying here that there are three branches or three organs of the state the legislature the executive and the judiciary the entities are the same okay the, the so categories are the same it's just two different ways of using the language either you say three organs of the state the legislature the executive and the judiciary or you say three branches of government you say legislative branch executive branch and you don't say judiciary branch you say judicial branch that's all okay we just want to be very particular about the use of language very important okay is this clear now so these so the idea in the theory of separation of powers which is quite important in the theory of separation of powers the idea is that uh, we want to prevent uh, tyranny okay so what we are doing is we are we are organizing government into three organs the state is organized into three organs and each organ has a specific uh, set of functions and so because the powers the functions are essentially to perform the functions you need to have powers okay so uh, therefore uh, the powers are separated uh, between the three uh, organs and there and that's how we have separation of powers that's what separation of powers refers to now what are the powers the power to the legislature is this clear makes laws you're familiar some of you are familiar with this legislature makes laws the executive enforces the law okay the term that we use is enforces the law okay and we can just say executes and enforces the law and then the judiciary interprets the law because sometimes you may have a confusion it's very common that you have confusions about what is the law uh, what does it actually mean the law may say certain things but what does it mean in a particular situation all right so therefore there's a confusion about that and so that has to go to the judiciary for an interpretation as to what what is the correct interpretation of the law all right so the point you're learning here in this particular sub module is the concept of separation of powers and the three organs of the state all right so these three branches right so this is the now idea here is that why do we why did montesquieu suggest that the separation this kind of government which you now find in most countries which are like to the western style liberal democracy model if you see any yeah yeah misuse of power abuse of power like for instance if, if you see the north korean constitution the north korean constitution is almost like a promising a paradise on earth everybody has a right to education right to food right to everything but in fact what happens is all power is concentrated but they actually don't have anything like they're eating grass okay uh, but that's because all the power is concentrated in kim jong-un right 
so because you have concentration of power so he decides who is guilty he decides what law has been broken and he decides the punishment also right like he blows people off using <laughs> cannons <laughs> and gets them eaten eaten by dogs and things like that so um, so therefore the problem that you have in North Korea is not that they don't have a constitution but because you don't have separation of powers all power is concentrated in one person all right or one entity so that's why you have a problem of tyranny you understand the word tyranny yes sir okay tyranny means like oppressive rule by one person or a small group of persons okay so the idea here in the uh, uh, separation of powers a best example of separation of powers purest example is in the u.s constitution and the idea is that the reason that you have ma managed to maintain a lot of individual liberty in the u.s is because there's a very strict separation of powers so what happens is this is also referred to if you leave the some of the links here okay you'll see this is also referred to as a system of checks and balances yeah so this is also called a system of checks and balances because each branch is acting as a check on the other each branch yeah I have a question like uh, you said that separation of power is for a for a yeah so you said that uh, separation of power is much for a liberal or a but, uh, no, it's it's only a must. Let me correct my statement. It's only a must to prevent tyranny, and it so happens that separation of powers, to some degree or the other, is a feature of these modern Western-style liberal democracies, of which India is also one. Okay, so your India, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, UK, USA, all these are the same broad model. Yeah, separate. All these have separation of powers. Yeah, so, yeah. I'll come to you. Uh, there can be a justification for like uh, if the parliament make a law. Yeah. And the Supreme Court can uh, oppose it. Yeah. It can uh can uh, just given by the Supreme Court can be uh, overruled by the can supersede the what Yeah. So so your very good question actually. So you have actually jumped several steps ahead. So we'll go slow slowly. Okay. So um, what what we have done, what's your name? Shubham Arora. Shubham Arora. Okay. So um, now what he has jumped several steps ahead. Okay. So what he has done is so, so so let's first understand checks and balances. All right. Checks and balances essentially are that one branch is acting as a check on the other. So for instance, if you take this current controversy about the CAA, what has happened is the parliament has passed the law. Okay. And it has gone through the normal process. The president has signed it and all that. So it has become an act, but it has been challenged. The constitutional validity of this act has been challenged by some people before the Supreme Court now whatever the Supreme Court says they may agree with the, the government or they may decide that it's unconstitutional so if they just assume that for the example for, for the sake of argument the, the, uh, the Supreme Court decides that this law is unconstitutional then the law cannot be enforced by the executive branch okay so because remember these guys make the law these guys interpret the law and these guys enforce the law but in a constitutional democracy the judiciary also usually has another job job and that is to uh, decide whether certain laws are constitutionally valid or not okay so this is what so this is the idea are you first able to understand the concept of checks and balances yes. that Parliament if they make a law the judiciary can actually uh, overrule that okay uh, and um, so, sorry, uh, but turn that down on the ground it being of it being unconstitutional. I'm coming to the second part which you asked. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tyranny is, is, is autocratic. Tyranny is autocratic. It's basically oppressive rule by uh, tyranny is used in a in the sense of a negative uh, it has a negative connotation. So it's oppressive rule by either one person or a small group of persons. All right. So tyranny, autocratic, you can say that. Okay. Autocratic has a less of a negative tenor, uh, connotation than tyranny. Autocratic is more focused on the process of decision making. Okay, so uh, it has less of a negative connotation, but tyranny is always used in a negative sense. Okay, now coming to the second question that Aurora asked, which is the first part is clear how checks and balances are happening. Okay, that the uh, constitution validity of a law can be uh, questioned by the Supreme Court by somebody coming to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court may rule. For instance, you might guys might remember the National Judicial Appointments Commission Act, NJSC Act. You remember several years ago in the first term of the Modi of the NDA government, the previous term, they passed this law to 
essentially bring because currently the system of judges the the way we select high court supreme court judges is completely under the control of the judiciary okay which is not the case in any other country in the world okay in the us for instance uh, president will appoint the supreme court justices so the executive has a strong say in the appointment of judges but in india it was all under the it still is under the control of the judiciary the higher judiciary so here what is happening is the uh, the government wanted to bring some more element of control from the executive branch they came up with this njac uh, uh, act but it was deemed to be unconstitutional by the supreme court so therefore that act was not able to go into force okay it is not part of our legal system so that's another example of checks and balances where the parliament passes a law according to its proper procedure but the supreme court says this law is unconstitutional this is clear now as far as this is concerned here what they are saying is as the second question that you asked which happened a lot in the case of it has happened in the sales tax legislation also uh, in many tax cases what happens is when the government loses a case before the supreme court they go back and they change the laws right they change the laws in such a way that the effect of the supreme court decision is nullified like you might have heard of the vodafone judgment the famous vodafone judgment of 2012 where there's several um, i mean i think several billion dollars claims by the in income tax department on vodafone were actually nullified by the supreme court i mean, the government won in the bombay high court but it was nullified by the supreme court the supreme court said these claims are not valid but then the government went back and amended the law all right so what happens is basically if the government says the when the judiciary uh, effectively interprets the law to be unconstitutional if they can make a constitutional amendment so what aurora is talking about is a situation where it happens a lot in the tax laws and it has also happened in our reg you, you guys are all familiar with reservation yes, yes. okay so this is also a big political issue in our country so reservation what has happened historically is that the governments have tried to increase the reservation categories several, over the years okay now how many people what category which classes are covered and how much is to be given for reserve quota right so this also what has happened is that the because if you have a sufficient parliamentary majority you can amend the constitution so the supreme court on one occasion says that okay this law is unconstitutional based on what the constitution says currently based on the current uh, uh, wording of the constitution it is unconstitutional but if the government if parliament can go back and amend the constitution then it will no longer be unconstitutional because what they do when they do these amendments is they see the supreme court judgment exactly what it says and then they go and change the words exactly in that manner so that the effect of that judgment is nullified are you following what we are saying yes sir. okay before uh, we just make sure that everybody follows all the steps yes are we all following first is checks and balances second is sometimes which are more uh, refined point that Aurora raised which is what about all these uh, parliamentary amendments those are constitutional amendments which if you have a sufficiently large majority in parliament you can amend the constitution okay it's pretty easy to amend the indian constitution and therefore then what they do is they effectively nullify the impact of the judiciary so in a way you can say that because in india the constitutional amendments we are already over 100 now i think gst was the 100 amend 100th or the 101st amendment okay so uh, because in india it's very easy to amend the constitution it's very easy to amend the constitution you don't even need a majority of parliament you if some of them are just absent that will also favor the amendment okay so you can just you know kind of in incentivize people not to be present in the class in in, in parliament etc so uh, this is basically the problem that you're highlighting here okay because it's very easy to amend the indian constitution therefore you could actually say that uh, by making the indian constitution so easy to amend we have actually diluted the extent to which the checks and balances are able to function separation of powers is essentially a system of checks and balances are you able to follow what we are saying yes sir. you need to understand how your country works this is also important these broader constitutional understanding is also important that effectively what we have done in our country by making the constitution so easy to amend uh, th what we have done is we have diluted the extent to which uh, the separation of powers actually acts as a system of checks and balances because the judicial check on the legislative branch is effectively diluted by frequent amendments to the constitution 
Are you following? Yes. Usually when they say that the when the judiciary says that the uh, particular law is unconstitutional, they are talking about the current text of the constitution. So if you go back and change the current text, then the judiciary will have to give a different interpretation. Are you following what we are saying? Right? So it's like if I make a rule saying that uh, food will be served only up to 8 p.m. Then you can say that whoever comes after 8 p.m. you don't serve them food. But then if I go back and rewrite the rule and say food has to be served whenever somebody comes to the table. So in that case you can no longer say that after 8 p.m. we, don't, we won't serve you. Right? So it's like the constitutional interpretation, the, the text is also already changed. So the point I'm, before coming to you, coming back to you, what I'm trying to emphasize is that the ease of amendment of the Indian constitution essentially dilutes the extent to which the separation of powers in India acts as a system, effective system of checks and balances. Effectively, we have a very strong parliamentary uh, system. Essentially, parliament is supreme by and large okay that's effectively what is happening yes what is the question sir uh, you said that uh, tribunal yeah you talked about that uh, sir i want to uh, highlight your point that during the time of emergency there was amendment in constitution so it would have need to perish. yeah so that's another example which i gave in the other class all right that uh, which is that the emergency is an example of uh, tyranny okay and because what happened again in the emergency is that the judiciary essentially folded these guys did not do their job the supreme court essentially was afraid of indira gandhi so they did not do their job and they did not uphold the fundamental rights in the way that they should have and today it's not just my opinion because today's supreme court including the son of the one of the people who were uh, there was the uh, justice chandrachur was one of the uh, people on the bench when they agreed to whatever indira gandhi said but his son dhananjay chandrachur has now actually said that those decisions during the emergency were not correct okay so today supreme court has admitted that the judiciary did not do its job during the emergency they should have actually resisted indira gandhi but they did not do that so essentially by and large you had historically also in india the structure of the constitution also ensures that effect Effectively, Parliament has a lot of the legislative branch is almost supreme. Okay, so the system of checks and balances is not working very well, and uh, this is something you should be aware of as a citizen. Okay, and you should be aware of the design and uh, how it's um, uh, how it's been corrupted. Yeah. What's the criteria to amend the constitution? Okay, I don't know the exact, but it's basically something like two thirds of those. We can look it up. We can look it up on the. Uh, we can look at the constitution. We'll come. I'll bring it up the next time. Okay. Yeah, two thirds. How how the present and voting. Present and voting. So what? If I have like actually there is full strength of parliament is 100 seats. I just make sure that only 30 are present. I incentivize the other guys to go somewhere else and they are not present so they don't count so all i need is basically two-thirds of 30. okay so that's basically almost jocular they should not have done this and see one more thing you guys should be aware of uh, is we are having this discussion without writing down too much that uh, the u.s constitution has been amended your uh, u.s has been there almost for 250 years the, uh, the if you look at the uh, the birth of the country 1780 roughly rounded off okay and there's almost 250 years and how many times the u.s constitution been amended i think it's only 26 times okay so 250 years only about 26 times and which country is more economically militarily powerful u.s or india yes. u.s most <coughs> dominant military economic power in the history of the world essentially you can say well maybe you can say the british were very powerful compared to the other countries so only 26 amendments to the u.s constitution in 250 years so that means one thing we can clearly say is that the ease of amendment of the constitution is not a factor in becoming an economic and military power is this clear you agree i mean you you understand what i'm trying to say here this is very clear because the u.s constitution is very difficult to amend very very difficult you need basically uh, you know congress to pass two-thirds majority then you need two-thirds of the states to agree they have 50 states so the 50 states no not Rajya Sabha the states yeah both congress has to agree at a two-thirds majority in congress plus you need two-thirds of all the states to agree okay so it's very difficult to amend the u.s constitution and that is why they have essentially managed i personally feel that's one of the reasons that is actually but clearly we can see that 
making a constitution difficult to amend does not impede your economic progress which eventually if you want to be a big military power you need to have a strong economy you can't be a big military power without a strong economy right are you guys following what we are saying yes. this is important important lesson to understand that because we even though we have amended 101 times we have not really achieved our potential as a country yes one minute yeah JNK's tyranny in what sense? Like uh, all, all the things that yeah, yeah. So that's a subjective assessment. See, tyranny is, for instance, a subjective assessment. Perception. See, people who agree with those policies will say it's not tyranny, and those who feel they don't agree with the terror policies, they will say tyr tyranny is again. Remember, it's a subjective assessment. Okay. So if I have a very strong, like some people might say that uh, in China you have a tyranny of the Communist Party. <coughs> But if people say that some people who feel that the Chinese Communist Party has done a great deal of work for economic development in China, they would not call it tyranny, right? Because you have to remember also in China, it's very easy for them to take decisions. They don't have the problems that we have. You see, parliament makes a law, then there's all this agitation. There's no agitation in China, okay? You cannot agitate. They will just <laughs> chop your head off. So there is no agitation in China. It's very easy to get things done. You want to do something, they just do it straight. All right. So, so therefore, it, it's it's a question of tyranny. Is a question. It's a subjective question. It, it's a, it depends on which side of the fence you are. Okay. All right. Yes. So can you say the political party? I mean, uh, uh, change the constitution for their own benefit? Yes, of course. Of course, no question about that. That's what political party. What Gagan is saying. This political parties are amending the constitution for their own benefit. Obviously. So every political party which has a parliamentary majority has uh, amended the the constitution for their own benefit. Like in the past six years, there is a Congress rule in India, and they have made so many changes. Yeah. So most of the, for instance, if you go back to the most of the reservation amendments, okay, every time what was happening is the government was saying that we will try to increase the reservation and uh, Supreme Court was trying to shoot it down and control the reservation. And so those reservation amendments were mostly under the Congress. Okay, so it depends and different times, different governments, sometimes they want to raise tax revenue. So they have a negative tax judgment against them in the Supreme Court. They would change the tax laws because they want more money. Right. Okay. So All right. This, uh, to a in a it's a loophole in the sense that this is the flaw in the design of the constitution that it is very easy to amend like there is a case going on Amish Shah Home Minister yeah and he's a Home Minister of India so one can find a way loophole yeah, there are flaws in the system. There are flaws in the system. Okay, don't, don't laugh at this question. See, the basic principle is see, some of your seniors also like, uh, some of your seniors, they get very nervous about asking questions because other classmates are laughing at them when they're asking questions. So, nobody should laugh at somebody. If he has a question, he'll ask a question. Sometimes I might decide that, okay, your question is not directly relevant to the course. We can discuss it later outside in the class. But nobody should be laughing at people's questions, okay? Because we want to encourage people to ask questions. That is the main reason you come to class. Yeah. So, yeah, what you're hinting at essentially is the views of the parliament, the constitutional amendment process, which is true. That is the, the root of the problem is how they made the constitution very easy to amend. They should not have done that. Big mistake. <coughs> That's why I showed you the example of the US. The makers of the constitution, uh, framers in India made a mistake because the US has proved that you do not need to have a constitution that is easy to amend to achieve economic prosperity. They have proved it clearly. <coughs> Sorry, yeah. Is it harmful to amend the constitution means frequently? If we, if we frequently amend the constitution, it will be harmful for the country also. Yeah, depend, that depends on, see, harmful, just like he was saying, tyranny in JNK. <coughs> These are subjective assessments. So, harmful or beneficial, that depends on how, where you stand. So, because 100 times have changed the constitution. Yeah. So, I personally think it is harmful because uh, it has given too much power to parliament. Parliament. And it has diluted the system of system checks and balances. So, from that point of view, because for me, this system is the most important. The separation of power and acting as a sec each branch acting as a check on the other branch this system I place a high importance on this system so my from my point of view I would say it's harmful but harmful and tyranny all these things these are subject depends on which side you are on right but as we adopted it, it is required to 
made an amendment to the Bill that we have adopted the Constitution, we didn't make a Constitution. So it may be required to... Yeah, that's what. So these, these are not clear-cut questions. That depends. Like what he's saying is that it was, he's suggesting it was harmful. You're suggesting it was not harmful, it was required. So these are, there's no end to this discussion because these are subjective assessments, right? It's like saying, I like pizza. Then you'll say, you don't know, I think pizza is a bad dish. So this is a subjective assessment. So there's no uh, end to this discussion, right? But it's okay. So you ask the question, but then I'll clarify that some of these questions are subjective. Okay, we'll come to this. Is this is this clear, guys? We have spent a little bit of time on this, but I hope you understand. Okay. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. You may clear it, but if people have questions, we have to allow them to ask questions. All right. Okay, guys, now there's one more point which I wanted to mention. There is a new discussion that is happening in terms of um, the uh, what you see, especially in the US. <coughs> is uh, uh, I would recommend everybody to everybody. What is the problem there? There's some problem. Impeachment. Impeachment and all that is happening. So what I would recommend to everybody in general is that um, please keep a sharp eye out on the US, follow the US economy, follow the developments in the uh, in the US economy. There's a lot to learn. It's a very developed economy. And because there's a lot of this garbage going on everywhere, you hear that India and China are going to overtake the US. So I would just like to make a statement, which is recorded, <laughs> recorded statement that this is all garbage. Okay, you forget about forget about my lifetime, even in your lifetime, the US is going to remain the most dominant economy. Okay, especially if uh, Trump wins a second term because the policies are very pro business, the economy is going gangbusters, they can't find they can't find people, they have seven and a half million open jobs, they're only six million unemployed people, the economy is very strong, they're building up the military again, the US will remain far ahead of both India and China, even in your lifetime. So if you keep a sharp eye out on following what's going on, it gives you a very good understanding of what a developed economy looks like you get a lot of ideas from there okay so a lot of these indian business school students have this attitude that oh we are only focused on the indian we need to only focus on the indian market that's a wrong attitude you should have a global perspective and an important part of that is being keeping an eye on the u.s economy what's going on there yeah there's a statement by trump that the u.s in india is a developing economy not developing who trump is said yeah, actually what he's contesting is the developing economy status of India and China under the WTO. Okay, because he's saying they're getting too good a deal. All right. So anyway, so the point, the point I'm trying to emphasize here is that we get to learn a lot about what goes on even politics is also important. One of the problems, <coughs> sorry, one of the problems that uh, Donald Trump is facing as president is there are a lot of the you know in in the in the government you know executive branch you understand yes, sir. The, the police is the part of which branch executive, executive branch executive. okay so our intelligence agencies raw CBI all are part of executive, executive branch okay so all report to eventually to the prime minister so in the in the executive branch there are actually two parts okay we should now think about the uh, uh, executive branch as having two parts the two parts now remember in india who is the head of the executive branch if you want to name the person the president. The president. Executive. yeah he's the titular head of the executive branch constitutionally he is officially the head the de jure head of the de jure means by law but de facto essentially he has he is bound by the prime minister and the cabinet yes. the advice of the prime minister so effectively the head of the prime uh, executive branch is the prime minister okay now does the prime minister is the prime minister also a part of the legislature Yes. Yes. yes, he's a member of parliament. Yes. So essentially what we have, the system we have, you know, understand the difference between the UK system and the Indian, UK and India on one side and the US. Okay, in UK and India, Boris Johnson is the head, is the prime minister. He's also the head of the majority party in parliament. The same with India, Mr. Modi is the head of the majority party in parliament. That's why he becomes prime minister. Okay, so there is a sort of slight um, uh, merging of these two branches overlap. right overlap you can say but in the u.s does donald trump sit in the legislative branch no so the u.s system of separation of powers is much purer much more strict because the president is separately elected by directly by the people okay so he's separately elected and the legislature is also separately elected by the people 
and they are not connected to each other in that sense okay in the sense that you see in india and uk so the u.s system has a more pure system of separation of powers okay which again might give you a hint because the u.s is far ahead of both uk and india even though the uk is actually many many uh, years older than the u.s right so the u.s managed to defeat a power like the uk and then eventually become the global superpower so uh, there's something to be said uh, this is why one of the reasons you should study the u.s constitution how the system works what made them so successful it's not an accident it's not an accident that they are so successful right just like we should also be asking this question why did a bunch of white people come and colonize us why did we go and colonize the white people is it just a coincidence no, or is there something more to it nobody asks this question you'll notice has anyone ever told, asked you this question in this country nobody ever asked this question were they doing something right were we doing something wrong okay did we lose touch with the essence of our uh, you know f uh, civilization and all that okay those are bigger questions but i'm just stimulating those ideas um, uh, in your head okay so is this clear that the point of the the point i want to emphasize is that the executive branch has two parts okay one is the part that comes and goes with elections so if let's say for the sake of argument if the bjp loses the next election will the next minister finance minister be from the bjp no, no. but will there be some is officers in the finance uh, uh, department yes, who will still be there yes, sir. right so the executive branch has two parts two types of entity uh, people in the executive branch one is the sort of set of people who are basically coming in and going out based on elections who wins the election and then some of them go out uh, but there's also a part of the executive branch which is what we call the unelected bureaucracy are the is officers elected by the people no sir. no so these are the unelected bureaucrats okay so it's important to understand based on what we have seen in the us recently this has made it a topical uh, thing to study okay which is that uh the idea that the executive branch has two types of people people who come and go with elections like mr modi mr piyush goel and all these people but also the unelected bureaucrats who don't come and go with elections they are permanent right they are permanent so these people what we call the term that is used to de describe them is called the deep state okay because they are kind of hidden you don't think of them because you think of finance as being done by the finance minister etc but this is basically uh, it has been referred to in the us as the unelected fourth branch of government but uh, as uh, your batchmate uh, correctly pointed out uh, i think janvi umad in the other class pointed out that it should not be referred to as a fourth branch of government because it's actually part of the executive branch okay it is part of the executive branch because if you go back to our principles of tax economy minimize the number of high level taxa so when something can be put inside the executive branch you don't create a separate category for it because in any case these are part of the executive branch are you following this yes. idea okay so very good point that she made in the other class all right so but they, in the us they have started referring to this as the unelected fourth branch of government that's why i have used this term okay but it is actually part of the executive branch which has two types of entities so you can read this article from the hill so one of the problems interesting to follow the us uh, one of the problems that uh, donald trump is facing is because he has been a very disruptive he came with the idea of disrupting he said i'm going to change the old ways of doing business okay now whether you agree with his policies or not but he came clearly with that message and then he got elected and then what he's trying to do is basically because the u.s government had become very centralized in terms there's a lot of bureaucracy in the u.s government he's trying to cut down the bureaucracy and you know decentralize power now people in washington who have been set in the old ways for many years they've been operating like this because republicans democrats nobody has disturbed the way of the old way of working so that's why many of the bureaucrats in washington are very angry with trump so they're trying to unseat him so many of these attacks that you're seeing through impeachment and the other investigations he basically had investigations throughout his term he's, he's never been able to sleep in peace he's always being attacked this is all coming from the unelected bureaucrats you know, the intelligence agencies were spying on him imagine that the fbi and the cia were conspiring to dethrone this uh, pre elected i mean when you look at it democratically you could like or dislike trump but if you look at it from a process point of view he's a democratically elected president 
but the unelected bureaucrats are trying to dethrone him they're trying to get rid of him by plotting against him behind the scenes so it's quite scary actually think about it from a process point of view so this is something that could technically happen also in india because we have that and we do know that mr modi has been very strict with the the is officers were sitting in with their they had they used to have their golf clubs in their offices but now he's cracking down because he's he demands a lot of accountability these guys are having to work hard so many of the bureaucrats are said to be quite unhappy with him it's because he's making them work too hard so there's technically this can also happen in india okay what has happened there the situation is the same because we do have an unelected branch so we need to look at uh, the unelected sort of sub branch okay this is an idea i wanted to just give you because in the paul science textbooks you will see only these three branches because they don't update the textbooks to reflect what is going on in the real world okay next point we are going to discuss is we are going to keep on moving like this from point to point okay and by and large i have highlighted everything and you have all the notes you have to just make sure that you understand this first point of distinction we want to understand is what is normative versus what is positive okay we can all see the casualties as we move forward many people are falling asleep but that's okay falling asleep is no problem talking is the problem okay normative versus positive is the first one okay in abortion you have to understand these terms that they use in the us uh, it's useful to know the labels pro life is basically those who are opposed to abortion okay because pro life because they feel that life begins at conception okay from the point of conception the the fetus is a living being and pro choice means the woman should have the choice so whether or not the abortion should be whether or not there should be an abortion this should be the woman's choice and the extreme forms of this view is, are that these guys extreme forms not everybody has the extreme form but the extreme form is here no abortion at all ever and these, these guys extreme form view is that you can abortion can happen any time including after birth now these people have come up with a new idea <laughs> that even after birth they what they do is they don't revive the baby they are having a discussion with the doctor is having a discussion with the mother and they just decide not to revive the baby so that is also a way so that is the, these are the extremes but not everybody has extreme but this is what it means this is what choice and life so the question now is okay now geetika is uh, very busy uh, playing with her phone yes you are you following what the discussion is in the class you are following it okay <laughs> i'm not very convinced with your answer but anyway okay so you understand what is normative versus positive what is is this a normative debate or what or a positive debate normative okay okay so normative essentially is something which is you can understand it in the point of from the point of view of subjective normative is typically more like subjective and we've got these distinctions okay we are discussing all these other distinctions also it's all written here okay subjective versus objective is the most easy for you guys to understand okay what is subjective and what is objective so <clears throat> if i tell you something let's first understand this maybe if i say to you if i give you an instruction saying that whenever it gets warm switch on the ac is that a subjective instruction or objective 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 sir subjective subjective what is warm what is warm for somebody when i want to warm okay say so kartik can say even 45 celsius is not warm for me how do you say that he's wrong you can't prove that he's wrong not warm for me so if i say that uh, turn on the ac whenever it gets warm it's a subjective instruction it's not a clear instruction because what is warm Exactly. right so if i now say that turn on the ac whenever it exceeds 32 celsius then it's so now it's objective because everybody's understanding of 32 celsius is the same okay is this clear so the first distinction probably the easier maybe i should have discussed this first the subjective versus objective is easier to understand okay so if we go back now here between normative and positive now if you understand this whole abortion debate <coughs> is this a subjective or objective it's debate subjective it is very subjective because you can't prove that the other party is wrong actually okay because it's a policy matter so generally most policy is normative deals with normative questions should we have reservation should we give reservation to jats should we give reservation to gujjas these are all policy questions these are not, you cannot say this is wrong or right it's all question of uh, these are normative questions right so therefore this is a normative debate what we are trying to understand is a normative debate typically tends to be subjective okay we have given you a link here you can read this link um 
positive and normative you can read it essentially normative talks about okay it's uh, <clears throat> what ought to be what should be so if i say that you know constitution should not be so easy the constitution should not be so easy to amend okay so i'm criticizing the current amendment procedure and uh, so that's a normative or some uh, positive normative. that's a normative statement because i'm saying that it should not be so easy is this clear all right and positive is just a statement about what is now positive statement need not be true okay it's a statement which is about which is about the state of affairs like this one here the moon is made of green cheese is the moon made of green cheese no but this is a positive statement because you are describing it it's a descriptive kind of statement it may be wrong but the you have to look at the nature of the statement the nature of the statement is such that it is describing something it does it's not saying the moon should not be so far away okay or the moon should be more bright it should not it's not make, saying these kind of statements not making a statement about what should be right it is telling you about what is it's making a statement about the state of affairs which may be wrong statement may be wrong but you have to look at the nature of the statement is this clear okay these are some theoretical concepts you should be clear about okay we can see very many people are very bored farhan looks very bored finding it boring okay so um, we'll we'll we just have to persevere with these ideas should be clear to you so this normative uh, abortion debate is a normative debate now what about this is this a positive debate or a, is this a debate about a positive question positive positive it's a positive question we should not say it's a positive debate uh, actually this is not a way, right way to word it is this a debate on a positive on a normative uh, because i'm telling you so much about the use of the language is this a debate on a normative or a positive uh, issue or a point okay or statement or whatever we'll we'll read that a positive uh, issue we can just write it okay is this clear that everybody here is this clear that this is a positive uh, this is a debate on a positive issue or a positive question the right way to use this, this is a positive question are you guys following generally section a seems to be getting bored much quicker than section b okay okay all right okay guys so this is clear that this is a positive statement of this is a debate about a positive issue <coughs> <coughs> huh? your statement was also normative which one section a gets section a no that's a positive statement because i'm observing that in section b people are generally not so bored but in section a people are getting uh, more people look very bored in section a i'm observing that for the last two uh, classes. classes yeah okay guys is this clear that this is a, a is a positive so what the point of understanding this is that you might have understood now you might realize now there's a lot of noise levels in the class high noise level in the class okay now you might if you look back on your life you might realize that many what we are trying to tell you is that be careful about arguments which are not value neutral okay so for instance argument what is a value not value neutral so be uh, careful about the usage so the abortion debate the abortion debate is not value neutral okay because you understand what value system is you know what a value system is like some people might maybe your elders maybe your grandfather and all they may have a more conservative value system yes. they might feel that you should not be going out late at night drinking this that okay so um, that is a conservative value system a more liberal value system might be that okay people can do whatever they want they are adults now okay they can smoke drink whatever right so uh, that's an example of a value system right so this is what uh, what we mean a value system essentially consists of a, a set of values okay so uh, what we say is that the what we are saying is that the abortion debate is not value neutral in the sense do you think this debate will ever end no. let's say i am pro life and somebody is pro choice no. if we keep debating is this is ever going to end <coughs> it's never going to end because it is based on it is driven by differences in value systems okay my value systems let's say more conservative maybe i'm a religious person and the other person is more liberal in the in the social sphere okay and so that's why they have this view so this kind of debate which is which is deriving from the disagreement is deriving from differences in value systems these debates have no end 
Okay, be quiet here. There's too much noise coming up. Actually, you just have to wait, wait for a few more minutes. Okay, practice this discipline. When you get bored in the class, this is part of your training. And when you get bored in the class, instead of you start talking to, so uh, starting to talk to your friends, try to concentrate, force yourself to concentrate, or go to sleep. Okay, so like some people have been practicing, which is fine. No, I have no problem with that. Okay, <laughs> now don't don't laugh with those who are sleeping. They they are following the instructions. That's fine. So the point we are trying to make is understand that if you are locked in a in an argument, when you are when you are involved in an argument, you should ask yourself. Is this argument value neutral or not? Are you following? So, as an example of a value neutral argument, what we are saying is abortion. The, the abortion debate is not value neutral. Yes, you're looking blank. Are you able to follow the statement yes, sir. that the abortion debate is not value neutral? Because if it were value neutral, it would be uh, independent of your value system. Here, this debate is not independent of your value system. We say, therefore, it's not a value neutral debate. More fact, it would have been more fact based. Yeah, it would have been more based on facts. So, is this clear? So, when you see these debates, don't get involved in them because you, you might notice that many debates in your life that you get into are actually not value neutral. Yes. So, it's a waste of time because you can argue till the cows come home and nothing will ever be resolved. Yeah? Yes. What is the question? All debates, uh, all debates are not material. Not necessary, not necessary, because it depends. Suppose I say, okay, suppose we are having a debate on what is the distance from uh, New York to Baghdad. Maybe you say it's 6,000, I say it's 3,000. We can solve that, we can just go to Google Maps. And if we are having, so I wouldn't agree that all debates, is this another example, guys? Now you understand? What is a debate? What is a, this is an example of a value neutral debate. If we are having an argument about, let's say, as he's saying, Baghdad, right? So, um, uh, if you are arguing about the distance between New York and Baghdad, right? <laughs> then, in that case, and somebody says it's 3,000 miles, somebody says it's 5,000 miles, we can fix that very soon, very quickly. Yeah. Do you agree? Driven by facts. It's based totally on facts. If we agree on what is a kilometer, this is not a problem to resolve. We go to Google Maps and we agree with what they say, right? So we can resolve this. Now, this is not a value neutral. This is a value neutral argument. Okay, so this kind of argument is worth having because you can figure out the answer eventually. You can learn something. Is this clear? All right. Okay, so this second debate is a debate on a positive, positive questions. Distance from here to Pitampura is you can figure out once again from Google Maps what is the actual distance so you can resolve this problem so this is a debate on a positive question okay all right okay so that's all we are saying here now this is just what we want to understand okay here now the point is that the positive statement need not be true okay a state uh, which is basically this has to be verifiable or falsifiable okay like the moon is made of green cheese the example that they gave you right that uh, that statement is not true but you can actually prove it to be false now here this brings us to an important question I've given you this link there's a philosopher called Karl Popper who's done a lot of important work very important concept for you to understand that uh, relates to the philosophy of science what is a scientific statement okay what is a scientific statement because in your life you will meet uh, a lot of people who pretend to be experts and they're making pronouncements on all kinds of things sometimes they're claiming that they're scientific but there is actually a critical test of what is a scientific statement according to Karl Popper's theory of science okay which is a very well accepted theory now where is this theory of science yeah you can read about this but I'll just give you the brief idea you can read the background here the idea of a scientific statement is this that the scientific statement must be falsifiable okay what is the meaning of falsifiable it has to be so specific that it is capable of being proved false okay so now if I make a statement that Roger Federer is less than six feet tall is this a falsifiable statement no yes sir. you can make that what am I saying I'm identifying a person Pedro I'm making a specific statement I never said I haven't said that he's not tall enough I have made a specific statement that he is less than six feet tall is that a very specific statement yes sir. you can just line him up against the wall and measure in fact the statement is false because he is more than six feet tall but the point is that you see the statement is very specific I am not saying he is not tall enough 
if I said tall enough then you can't falsify it because I'll say if you're not as tall as LeBron James you're not tall enough then I can say it. so then you can't prove that it is false is this clear are you following what I'm saying this is a very important thing to understand because when you are listening to experts talking about topics and they are making you'll find many of them make very loose general statements those are not scientific statements because they cannot be falsified okay in the sense if I say that something is uh, it's uh, you know it is very warm in uh, mercury is very warm or something like that what is these are very general statements these are not specific enough so you can't falsify it so if I say that the moon is made of green cheese is that a scientific statement yes sir yes sir it some is. people are saying it is because Bodhi Raja says it's no it's not false it's not a scientific it is scientific yes Aman, why is it why is it scientific now explain to me the answer is in front of you if the moon is made of green cheese is a scientific statement why not false not falsible falsifiable okay so it is capable of being proved to be false right is this clear it's a specific statement you can take a section of the moon it doesn't have to be technologically possible it just should be theoretically possible you can cut off a section of the moon you can send Hanumanji there you can cut off a section and uh, you can see that it is not made of green cheese yes is this clear now you understand what is meant by a scientific statement that it has to be falsifiable the exact word we are looking for is falsifiable it doesn't actually should not be verifiable I should not put this verifiable here I want to make this because we moved away from verificationism verifiable is very different from let me just remove this uh, okay in the case of a positive statement we can have this but in the case of a scientific statement it is falsifiable okay guys Walia, be quiet from the next class onwards now I'll be start I'll start deducting marks because uh, so marks reduction should be for the group as a whole no, or should be individual individual. <laughs> individual okay so every time I catch you doing anything uh, which is not allowed which is talking disturbing others okay you will lose two percent and that will be taken out of your end term grades so it is going again usually it goes against the CP grade but that's on a group basis but I'll take it out of your end term grades so please remember that okay for the next class onwards we are going to deduct marks okay so first this point is clear for, you understand very important point because very important point because you need to be able to test when you are listening to media personalities talking about the economy etc economists try to analyze which of their statements can be called scientific scientific statements are they so specific that they can be proved false mostly they are all garbage they say oh the economy will be quite strong what is the meaning of quite strong 4% 6% 9% 15% it's a meaningless statement okay if you say that the economy will next in next quarter the economy will grow by three and a half percent that's a falsifiable statement you understand that yes yes sir. Ria is not convinced is this clear the last segment is falsifiable okay we we'll, I'll release the rest of the class you guys can go you can come here I'll explain to you so the recording so in this case when we have a recording which extends beyond the class because somebody has asked a question that recording is also part of your syllabus okay so whatever I explained to her because I'm sure many other it's just that she's asking the question I'm sure many others are also confused but they have not asked the question okay so the rest of you guys can go and now she's regretting that she asked the question because now she has to come here no. So the first statement, if I if give, if I make the statement that the economy will be very strong in the next quarter, is this a scientific statement? What is our test of a scientific statement? Our test of a scientific statement is that it has to be falsifiable. 
So if you apply that test and I tell you that the economy will be very strong in the next quarter, is that a falsifiable statement? Sir, it is not very specific. It's not? It's not very specific. It's not very specific. So you can't falsify it. So if I say the economy will be very strong in the next quarter and actually the economy maybe grows by 0.001%. But I'll say that that's also strong. I never said, I never gave you a specific number. Right? Are you following? That I never gave you a specific number. But now, if I say that the next quarter GDP growth will be 3.5%. Okay, or more than 3.5%. Now that is a specific, very specific. So all you have to do is you have to wait till the end of the next quarter till the GDP data comes out and you can see what the reading is and if it is uh, less than three and a half or more than three and a half, I can either way. Remember, falsifiable does not mean it has to be false. It has to be capable of being proved to be false. Which means you have to look at not the, the statement itself. Yes, you have to look at it to see whether it's specific. But you have to analyze the nature of the statement. Is it something which is capable of being proved to be false? Okay, which means you can, and if you prove that it is not false, that is also the same as proving that it is false. Like if the growth is four and a half percent and I said it will be greater than three and a half. The statement itself is capable of being proved to be false because all you have to do is wait till the end. After the quarter you can see that the data comes out what the actual figure is. Now I made a specific statement. So the idea of specificity is intimately connected to the idea of falsifiability. Because usually statements which are not falsifiable are basically are essentially not sufficiently specific. Like I say that oh economy most of the time experts are TV you will find they will make general statements, yes, not what, specific. What if I say a positive statement and there is not a way, uh, there is no way to test it yet. Like I say, uh, I say that uh, for example, uh, what is, uh, for suppose we don't know about Pluto right now, and I say that Pluto is uh, this much kilometers uh, far. So what about that? Is that a, uh, that even there we don't consider the current limitations of technology. It just has to be that you should be, this should be theoretically possible to prove that it is false. What do you assume? If we don't have a way to test it or if we don't have any basis for calculating it also, in that sense, falsify it. Yeah, in that sense, so you can qualify that statement a little bit, but it is still technically falling under the reason, like if you have the technology, okay, assuming that we don't have the technology to go to the moon, okay, so we say that this, but it is still a statement which is, if you had the technology, you could prove, to be, prove it to be false. The nature of the statement is specific. Okay, so you can assume that uh, technology limitations will also be removed. You have to really look at the essence of the nature of the statement. Okay.